horse walked under the great beeches, lazily padding by the side of the road. Now and again he stopped to graze, his white head cropping the grass, his tail sweeping the flies away in slow, rhythmic switches. Always after he had eaten, he went on again in the same direction, along the road which led to his stable. The knight sat with his head drooping, one hand listless on the reins. The wound in his stomach had almost stopped bleeding now, but he could feel its edges pouting like a red mouth. There was no pain, no sensation, but his face was pinched with past agony, the lips and eyes blue-shadowed. At last, so quietly, so easily that he hardly realised it, he leaned farther forward, drooped sideways, and slid to the ground. His horse gazed at him sadly, mildly, and went on. Now he lay under a green hedge with the grasses sweeping his face and a nettle grinning at him with green teeth. The sky darkened and spun as the pain returned and his face grew cold in the sunshine. The horse went on under the beeches, his silken ornaments tawdry and draggled. There was no one to stop him, to question or harass him with further journeyings and loud frightened cries. The castle gate swung open, wide and untended, and unseen he padded the dusty path and stopped to graze where the grass was greenest. They had left the castle two days ago, when they heard that the enemy were coming. A shrill scream had run over the countryside, a cry of alarm, and the women had listened with pale faces. The enemy! The enemy! Our men are fighting, but they cannot hold them. Give them the castle, give them our homes, our riches, our land. It is easier to part with these than with our honour. They filled their hands, they grabbed what they could, and in an hour the stables were emptied, and the lady of the castle headed the retreat, her robes flowing, her hands grasping the reins like a man's, beating out the words, Oh, hurry, hurry! The castle was deserted, inside and out. The battlements jutted sharp into the sky, the flag drooped on its pole. In the kitchen, a yellow dog whined and stretched itself before the hearth. The big black pot was bedded in ashes and the soup inside had turned sour, a rancid scum mottling the surface, a thin dust sifted over it from the shifting of the fire. The dog was thirsty. The vermin which trespassed at night had kept him from hunger, but there was no water anywhere. Yawning, his eyes dull, he stretched himself and set off on another search. Quietly, patiently, he pattered out, his claws scratching bluntly, his head poked forward in the dust of the passages. Even the cat had gone. He pushed against a door which stood ajar and found himself in the high dining hall. From habit, he went to his old corner beside the hearth where he would wait for his master to throw him the bones and scraps from his plate. Head erect, ears cocked, he waited. But there was no one in the high chair. No sound of laughter, no red faces flaming over the wine flagon. He sighed, and his ears drooped, and his tail went limp between his legs. Up the stairs he went, round and round, up, and up like a dog on a treadmill. Here there were rooms which told the story of flight. He poked his head into every one but backed out again, timid, defeated. In the last room, the largest, something was stirring, a flurry of sound, a soft, metallic jingle. He tiptoed in, whimpering. A velvet gown was thrown on the floor with satin slippers and a box of bright silks. The couch where my lady had lain was all in disorder, and her brushes lay askew on the table. On a perch by the window, a goshawk rustled its striped feathers and stamped angrily, trying to jerk itself free. It looked at the dog, and the dog leaped forward, yelping and panting and wagging his tail frantically. The bird sat still, quieted for the moment. The velvet on the floor was ruffled under the dog's feet, and the slippers and trinkets were scattered as he pranced in joy. Yap, yap, he went, and the noise of his breathing filled the pauses between his barks. 
the bird's head crouched lower and lower, till at last it lunged forward with its wings raised and its beak hooked and vicious. It stabbed twice, and the dog rolled back in dismay, still yelping and hurt at the unexpected hostility. Once again he tripped up to the perch, his eyes pleading, but the goshawk glared and beat at him, rattling its fine silver chain, so that he retreated, howling, down the stone stairs to the quiet and the loneliness. The white horse stood before his stables in his torn trappings. Inside was food and shade from the sun, but the door was shut and no friendly hand came to open it. Everything was dusty and dry, no water anywhere. The fountain in the yard had stopped playing long ago, and though one of the pipes still trickled, it left only a thick smear of slime oozing over the stone basin. The horse snuffed at it and turned away. Up in the tower, the goshawk stared coldly at the tumbled finery of my lady's boudoir and wrenched afresh at its chain. The knight lay with his knees drawn up to ease the gash in his stomach. His mouth was dry, and though he could feel the stone sharp under him, he had no strength to move. He could not even lift a hand to wipe the dust from his face. Where was he? The world was all out of focus. There was a rustle of leaves over his head, and grasses waved round him, tickling his ears with their feathery tips. The sky was a deep blue, shading off pale towards the horizon. Against the blueness the leaves overhead were black, and the grass in which he lay was colourless. It must be night. There was no wind, and yet the beech leaves, infinitely more remote than the sky, rustled and trembled miles up in space. The nettle, which had grinned in daylight, now stood like a spiky sentinel, every leaf rigid and strong. It was too virile, too tense among the delicate grasses. He looked back to the sky, from the farthest turquoise edge to the deep azure above, and then he turned his head and saw the battlemented edge of his castle against the deepest blue of all, and the world swung into focus so suddenly that it dizzied him, and he clung to the ground for safety, forgetting that he could not fall. His home was just beyond the opposite hedge. A little farther on were the gates, and then the drive curving back in shadow till it reached the castle. His horse must have gone on alone. Why then had nobody come to help him? Perhaps they had not guessed he could be so near. Perhaps the horse had gone back to his stable unseen. They were often idle, these hostlers, and knowing their master to be away, they would be neglecting their duties. Well, any time now, they would come for him. With an effort, he dug his hands into the grass and levered himself higher, leaning against the bank. Strange how weak his arms were. He felt the wound drag its crusted edges and drew up his legs again. Now he could watch the tower and wait for them coming. They would bring lights and a litter to carry him home. They would have water and the unguents to salve his wound, wine for his parched throat and soft linen to lie on and his lady would weep over him but smile because he had returned to her. It was very quiet, as still as death. No voices carried from the castle, no lights winked from the windows. An owl swept past like a shadow, and a faint glitter of stars was washed up on the deepening tide of blue. Next time he woke, he thought the day had come, the sky had lightened, and the moon was so bright that he could see everything, the stones in the road, the blood on his clothes, and the colour of the bluebells in the grass, pale beside the crimson of clover. The dead white light poured down, and he was suddenly afraid. Why did they not come? Did his lady not feel? Did she not sense that he was here? He turned his head restlessly, but he could not move himself more. It was like lying in a nightmare, pressed down by the knotted covers and the weight of sleep. His head was giddy with too much moonlight. Perhaps he was sleeping now. He would be better in the morning. 
the dream would pass, and he would rise up rested and walk into the great hall, and they would flock to welcome him, and she would nurse him back to his old strength. He started. His dog, his little yellow dog, was howling far away. It lifted its head and howled at the moon, a long bay dying away in sorrow. The night was weak, and the sound made the sweat start all over his body. Hey, Jacko, he tried to call, but the voice stuck in his throat, and his lips were too dry to whistle. When the howling had died away, he watched the tower, ready for all manner of curses to fall in it, witches skimming the coping like bats, flames leaping red from the stone. But the moon shone steady and pale, and nothing moved, not even the dust. He opened his eyes again, not knowing that he had slept. His head was heavy, and the whole world pressing down on him, and his mouth was dry, burned up with fever. The sky was grey, the grasses moist and fresh, and the castle seemed far away now, happed in a white mist. It was cold, so cold that there was hardly any sense in his limbs. It took him a long time to think, to remember who and where he was and why he was lying in damp grass with nothing to moisten his lips or slake his throat. His mind went wandering in circles, like the bird which hovered above him, round and round, never settling, but never leaving the one spot. He started when it alighted beside him, pleased at its nearness, the tameness which let it stand unafraid. Idly he watched its eyes, its strong beak, and barred feathers. It was a beautiful bird. His mind was so slow that at first the chain on its leg meant nothing to him. It was a delicate chain, broken off raggedly and round the leg was a silver ring, the coat of arms graven finely, so that it stood out clear for all it was so minute. When at last the meaning seeped into him, a faint flush of warmth ran into his body. Strength came back to his hands, and his fingers fretted and tore at the torn silk of his cloak, but all he could wrench off was one thread. He held out his arm, and the bird came nearer, as it was used to do when he called. Fumbling with weakness, he looped the stuff inside the looseness of the ring till the bird protested and flapped its wings. It was done, though. It was accomplished. Now, as it had been taught, it would fly to its mistress, and soon, soon... It would not move. Sinister, it raked its beak along its claws, and ruffled its soft feathers. Its eyes were cold, but expectant. And suddenly the knight knew that there was no one for it to fly to, and that it would watch beside him now till the last. Beyond that, he did not care to think. <laughs>